Here we go. All right, y'all turn to Matthew 6. We're going to read from the Sermon on the Mount, verse 16. While y'all turn in, I remind y'all what we're talking about. We're, we're dealing with Luke 5, 27 to the end of the chapter. And Christ is in Matthew's house. Matthew's throwing a feast for him, and there's a bunch of publicans and sinners there. In other words, just the, the dregs of society, according to the Jews. Well, the Pharisees show up, and the Pharisees don't like it. And the first objection they have is, why are you eating with people like this? Obviously, if you're eating with these unclean people, then you're just as unclean and foul as they are. So certainly we're not going to hear anything you say, to which Jesus replies, where would you expect to find me? My job is to, I'm like a doctor, don't you find a doctor among sick people? I'm here to call sinners to repentance, so where do you find me? Amongst the sinners. Well, their next objection is, well, then why aren't y'all fasting? Why are y'all having a good time? Hey, you know, I had a quote from Irma Bombeck. I wish I'd have wrote it down. Y'all remember Irma Bombeck, the, yeah. in the newspaper and all? There was a quote where she said she was told one time as a child by a family member, quit smiling, you're in church. <laughs> Think about that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't we know something about that kind of formalism? Yeah. If you grew up Catholic, yeah, Courtney's got it. If you grew up Catholic, you wouldn't know nothing to be happy about and better not look happy. I mean, seriously, it's a, it's a ridiculous thing. And that's kind of what they're saying. And what Christ answers is, why on earth would you go to a wedding feast and tell the people to fast. It's not a time for fasting. It's a time for feasting. The Jews had been looking for the Messiah and fasting and, and praying and, and crying out for Him for hundreds of years, and now He's here. Why would they go on doing that? He said, there'll be a time when I leave and they can return to doing that, but not now. And you'll find out that they did do that. And matter of fact, when He died for three days, they were in terrible perils, weren't they? But what did they do again on the third day? They rejoiced and celebrated. See, that this is what he's dealing with. Now, in the Pharisees, uh, with their fasting, I want you all to read what the Lord says here in uh, Matthew 6, 16. He said, Moreover, when you fast, fast, or when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. What's their purpose for fasting? Show attention. They want, they want to get notarized. Hey, look what they're doing. Oh, those are the pious religious people, right? It says, But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face. He said, Don't you oil your face up and look as healthy as you can? Nobody needs to know you're fasting. That's between me and you. He said, That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Now, that's how they fasted. I want you all to go to Matthew 15. Now, neither one of the Jews' objections. Let's get this down here. Their two objections are, number one, you're, uh, how would we say it, you're... You're with sinners. Okay? You are with the unclean that they would say the law says you can't be with them. But let me ask y'all a question. Is that anywhere in Moses' law? No. Then where'd that come from? It's their tradition. Their traditional interpretation of the law. Folks, they would take the law. If I was to show y'all the verse where they got that from, you would say, how in the world it, they would just keep pulling and stretching and pulling on it. And like I told y'all, the Talmud, it, it's that high. It's all their opinion. So they had all these traditions. And what did their traditions do? They just marred the law. It covered it up. Nobody knew anything. It's the same with Catholicism. He, when did anybody ever, Courtney, sit us down and say, hey, here's our doctrine? What did they do instead? They just let you hear what aunt so-and-so said and cousin so-and-so said. and What's that? Make the sign of cross by, okay, when you go by the cemetery, make the sign of cross or you go to hell. Uh, what do you do what now you know and every church had different little things they did different little things wherever you go it's all just a bunch of tradition so what do they essentially do they're hiding their doctrine by their tradition don't y'all see why they want to they don't want you to know their doctrine. Well, the Pharisees had th this idea that it was against the law to be, for him to be with the publicans, right? The second thing they said is, well, hold on a minute. He's not fasting like we do. 
Did their law tell them to fast like they do? No, they had feasts instead. Yes. <laughs> so then, Mr. Bailey's right. The Jews had far more feast days than fast days. But what essentially it come down to is the Pharisee said, you are against, not Moses, you're against our traditions. Okay, and that was their problem. Now, don't we all know something about this? You know, we do certain things because Granny did it that way. And to tell me, well, that's not how you do it is, oh, no, don't tell me. I mean, this is right. We've and never done it that way. It's never been done the way you're saying, so obviously it's not right. And it's essentially what Jesus was doing in His preaching, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. Y'all remember how He would phrase His things? You have heard that it hath been said by them of old time. Th -th -th Thus. He said, but I say unto you. When He said, but I say, who's speaking? God. God that gave them the law. Who do y'all reckon was a better interpreter of the law? <laughs> right? So essentially he was straightening out their, their bad interpretation. And that's all they're doing that day in, in that house is they're giving Jesus Christ their interpretation of, of things. And it's not correct. So Jesus uh, says this in Matthew 15. 15.1 Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why did thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? See it again? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Now, is it good to wash your hands before you eat? Sure. Did Moses' law say it? No. no. Folks, Moses' law didn't say that. He says, He answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Now think about it. He said, they said, you transgress our traditions. He said, you transgress the law of God in your traditions. He said... They had a, a special way to wash their hands. I mean, they yep. had to do it just exactly right. That's exactly right. Like a Muslim has to. Uh -huh. And I mean, literally, they would get... And it depends on which sect you were from. You got to wash the left one three times and the right one four times or vice versa. I mean, everything was like that. Everything they did was this way. Now it says in verse 4, he says, For or because God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and let he that curse a father and mother, let him die the death. Now in honoring thy father and mother, it means more than just loving them and being appreciative that they gave you life. It means when they need something, you take care of them. Look, God set up the family unit so it works perfectly until we sinners ruin it. He says, But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. What they would do, the Jews would look at the cost of maintaining their father or mother, and what it would cost, along with the heartache, and they would say, I don't really want to do that, but I don't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. I want to be in right standing in the community. I want to look right. And the synagogue would tell them, I tell you what, take that portion of that and make a donation to us, and then you'll be free from that because you've used the money in a better cause. Now, that's what the Jews taught. That's the truth. Okay? That's what they taught. And so, which one was the law? Honor thy father and mother. Then what did they put above the law? Their tradition. Do you realize Rome's official stance is the tradition of the church trumps the Scripture? That's their official stance. I mean, seriously, they will officially say that. And what the Pope says trumps everything, right? Now, what about not Rome? Folks, we got this everywhere. We've all got this kind of stuff in us. Look, when we believe something by tradition, it is very hard to get us to come off of it, isn't it? Very hard. Especially if I have believed for years that I'm saved because I walk the aisle or I said a sinner's prayer. Or, never go to a movie. Yeah, never went to a movie. <laughs> um, he, he, I was thinking about you and your buddies at the train station, Mr. Bayless. I won't tell him. But I, anyway, what the Pharisees' problem is, is this. Christ is teaching something that's causing turmoil within them. That's all it is. If what you're saying is true to this group, then what we're saying is wrong. Now, what are they going to have to do? They're either going to have to throw out the old and put on the new, 
or they're going to have to reject the new and stay with the old. And that's the parable he's going to say. Now there's a third option. Some of them tried to adopt that into their, in other words, fit it in. Make it work. Make it work, right? And look, people, I watch people do this all the time in classes. You kind of begin to pick up on their face. You can see the wheels turn and they see something. And lots of times it's in the Scripture and they see it and they look and you see the wheels start turning and there's, there's a little internal strife there. And yet they keep working on it. And then you can see when they finally kind of and they sit back and what they have just done is they've just taken that and twisted it and then did it where it still fits in what they've been. Everything's okay. Now don't we all do stuff like that all the time? We might not do it with the Word of God, but we sure do it with other things, don't we? I mean, we will put a square peg in a round hole or vice versa if it saves us discomfort. Okay? So this is what he's dealing with. Now in verse 6 he says, the man that does that and not honor his father or his mother, he shall be free. He says, thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by, you, by your traditions. Now, were the Pharisees teaching the truth? They're teaching their traditions. So, was anything that they lodged against Christ that day, any complaint against Christ dealing with these publicans correct? No. But how are you going to get that across to them? Very hard, isn't it? Very hard. So Christ defers to a method of teaching that is in the Scripture His most popular method. One third of the things Christ said, He said in parables. And you'd say, well, why? Parables were designed to do two things. Number one, a parable for those that had, the parable would give them a little more, shed a little more light on the subject. But what about those that had not? It would take away even that which they thought they had. In other words, when he spoke by parables, it was two things. It was revelation to those that were his, but it was judgment on those that were not. They would come away, and literally the judgment is what Isaiah said, seeing you see not, and hearing you hear not. Now how can God make a person not hear? You just don't regenerate them. We're born deaf. We're born blind. If you stay that way, you see how not understanding what he was saying was a, was a form of pronouncing judgment on them? And so the Pharisees would walk away from these things, and what would they say? What was that nut talking about? But the, what about the believers? Peter and them would get him privately aside and said, Tell us more about that parable. Explain it more. And he would give them more understanding. Did they understand all things perfectly? But did they get a little more? And that's the whole picture here. And so he does this. Now, uh, neither of the Jews' objections, again, were according to the law. And that's the entire point of this passage. Y'all go over to Romans 10. Paul explains... I tell you, let's go from 9.30. That'd be better. Romans 9.30. Now, Romans chapter 9 is telling us all about two different Israels. The actual people of God amongst Israel, and then all those that claim to be the people of God. And he tells us that the people of God heard the preaching and believed it and followed Him. But what about those that just professed to be? They couldn't figure out that not only did they not want to have Him, they didn't even want to hear what He had to say. So in verse 30 he says, What shall we say then? Well, here's the answer. That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, the Gentiles weren't trying to get righteous with God. They weren't trying to keep anything. They weren't. They're just pagans. He said, they have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, after the flesh, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone as it is written. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Along comes Christ, and what does the Scripture say he was to Israel? A stumbling block. Can't y'all see that in this example we've got? He's talking to the... Uh, the Pharisees that day, he's in there with the publicans eating and drinking with them and saying things to them. And what did the Pharisees say? They look at him in that setting and folks have compassion on him because according to everything they've been taught all their life, this man can't be from God. If he was from God, he wouldn't be with them. 
And so what are they? They, they reject him. You see, he's the stone of, uh, he's the rock of ages for the believer, isn't he? But for the Jew, they stumbled over him. They could not fit him into their logic. And that's the whole point. Lord, why, why is that word you shamed? Huh? Uh, should not be ashamed. Oh, verse 33, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed in the day of judgment. If you believe on Christ, you won't be ashamed. Matter of fact, even in the day of that judgment, if you believed on Christ, you weren't. Were Peter and them ever put to shame? No. Folks, everything they believed was true and played out right. It just never seems like it's used, you know. It's a little different than how we use it today. Yeah. Um, to be ashamed literally is to be found with fault before the eyes of the public. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that, go ahead. Hmm? Yeah, Wayne? What about your works after you get saved? Yeah, now we're saved unto good works. Yes. We're not, our works do not contribute to our salvation. They're not the cause of our salvation. But if your salvation is real, works will follow. Okay? Mm -hmm. If not, it's going to be about self glory. Yeah, it is. And you look, if, if, the, if the works to the glory of Christ don't follow, and if the works that we do are to our own glory, we need to take a look at our salvation. James because, 1, 26. Yes, absolutely. And, and if, you, if you continue reading on where he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, the faith is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But then he says, For we are His workmanship, He did all the work, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In other words, you have been saved in order to do something. Which God has <clears throat> set for, for, yes. for you. Which God has foreordained. In other words, God has got a plan for everybody He saves. Right? It, Boy, I think we were taught the total opposite. Yeah, we were. Even as I was under conviction and trying, I was trying. Yep. I was trying to get there, trying to figure it out. I was trying. Yep. Even though I kept saying, well, I know it's not of works. But, but you still you try. Still, and I still do that by habit. Yep. That's what you we're taught. You, you just It's hard to get that out of your head. The it is. And I'll tell you, for those of us that were raised like me and you and Courtney, the other thing we'll fight is we'll begin to think after we're saved that somehow those good works keep us saved. And if we're not doing them, maybe we're lost. No. Yes. Folks, you gotta, you got to realize something. A person that's saved is saved because God has decided to make them the object of His affection. And that affection never changes. If you are the object of His affection, He loves you warts and all. Now, isn't that how we treat our children? Yeah. I mean, there is nothing that Jackson could do that would cause Courtney to quit loving him. Is that right? But I bet Jackson does a lot of things that gets on her nerves. <laughs> well, what do you do with a child that's yours that you love? Love them. You love them and correct them, and you do it in love, don't you? And that's the same thing. So the minute that we believe that we're sanctified by something we're doing or kept, no. We're kept by the love of God. And that's what we got to remember, warts and all, okay? Now, watch what it says in chapter 10, verse 1. He said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He don't mean the whole nation. He means every individual, okay? He says, For I bear them record. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Paul said he was the most zealous Pharisee. But would it save him? You know, every time I read the word zeal, I think about those poor teenage boys on them 10-speed bikes in August, riding up and down the streets in three-piece suits, I mean, burning up, knocking on doors, people saying horrible things to them. They are very zealous, aren't they? I tell you all, we Christians could take an example from them in their zeal. I work, I work with a father that had kids like that. Yeah. And... I was with him when the kid went away from home. Yeah. I told him, I said, I, I just can't understand you. You know, yeah. they let those kids go out into the world. Yeah. On them yeah, they got to experience it. But y'all know something? They're zealous. Oh, yeah. But are they zealous according to God's? No. It's, it's all nothing. Folks, can y'all imagine suffering the loss of all of it? But they will. Now he goes on and says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. What did the Pharisee think was his righteousness? 
His traditions keeping, his, his birth in Adam, everything he was doing, he thought, made him right. And who's standing before them? The righteousness of God, Christ. And what do they do? They look at Christ and they don't see the righteousness of God. They label Him as unrighteous as the publican. What's their problem? They're blind. Folks, they can do nothing else. Something is blinding them. I want to show you all that it's not just that God hadn't given them sight. It's that they're, they're, they want their blindness. Hey, you know, there was an example that it's, it's a famous one. I certainly didn't come up with this, but it fits. A fellow that... Uh, went on a missionary trip. A preacher from Philadelphia went on a missionary trip, I think 1930-something. And he went down to Columbia or somewhere down in that area to meet with some uh, missionaries they were supporting down there. And when he got off, he noticed, you know, when you get off a boat, it's like, y'all go to Mexico and here come the little kids selling stuff. He said that they had young people selling these little monkeys. These little monkeys they would catch in these trees. And the missionary said, it's interesting how they catch those monkeys. He said, how? They had them in little cages. He said, there's a gourd that grows down. Y'all know what a gourd is? They had a gourd that kind of grew long like a string bean. He said they take that gourd when it's little and they drop down from the top of it a little bit and they tie a string around the neck of it. So the gourd grows. It grows on the bottom and it grows at the top, but it's got that bottleneck in it. They make like a bottle, right? Then they take the gourd, they cut it off, they get the top open, and they put rice down in there. And they tie it to the tree. That's all they do. The monkeys want to eat the rice. The monkey takes his little hand and he can slip it down through there, but he grabs him a fistful of rice, and guess what? He can't get out. And that's how they trap them. They don't need a hook. They don't need anything else. Think about it. What's got that monkey trapped? He won't let go of that rice. He's got a hold of something and he will not let go of it. Folks, that's the Pharisees. And it's so many people today that have these different religious things that they're hanging on to that they will not let go of. Until we empty our hands of that stuff, we can't let go and see Christ. And so this is the position they were in. Now, um, the Pharisees were convinced that they were fighting for the truth. Folks, they thought they were fighting for ethical purity. I mean, seriously, they thought they were fighting for the morality of the nation. Y'all know we got a lot of people today that feel the same way in our country. Look, the, the Pharisee was ultra-conservative. Now, I'm not picking on conservatives. If you want to talk politics, well, yeah, I'm conservative. I believe if you work, you eat. So, I mean, that's right. But if you're going to be conservative, don't we need to know what we're trying to conserve? What was a Pharisee trying to conserve? The Word of God? Traditions. Traditions. Y'all think about it. Lots of people today are trying to conserve a tradition. Hey, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But you've got to realize something. If you're going to take a stance on it, at least know what you're trying to conserve. And the Pharisee didn't. The Pharisee did not realize. Look, most people in our country today are, that are conservative, do they want to conserve the American way of life? Yeah. I'd love to see things go back to day like I heard they were in the 50s. You know, I hear people talk. I'd love to see that. I don't like what I see today. But am I willing to get out there and fight and, and, and argue and throw rocks over it? No. But were the Jews? Yeah. Folks, the Jews crucified Christ to conserve their religion. They saw Him as the threat to their religion. And not only that, they saw them at Him as the threat to their position because the Pharisees were in the driver's seat. So what they were trying to conserve wasn't really what they were you know, actually doing. In, in trying to conserve a false truth, they were fighting against the truth. Is that, I hope that makes sense. All right, now, um, again, it's easy to, for me and you to get caught doing this. But watch Christ's second reply to this because He answers this. Go back over to Luke 5. They want to know why you're not fasting. He's got an answer for them. In Luke 5, 34, <clears throat> He said unto them, Can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom's with them? Now, children of the bride chamber don't mean the, the offspring of the marriage. It means the sons. Of, in other words, can you make the, the best men and the groomsmen and the family uh, mourn while they're at... No. 
at, at a wedding like that, what are the best men doing? Yeah, they're getting drunk today, right? Having a big... But in other words, it's a time of, of jubilee. He said, you can't make them do it. Now, he goes on to say, the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. What do y'all reckon he's referring to there? When he's killed. Right? He said, and then shall they fast in those days. Now, the idea of the Lord as a husband to His people is not new. It's all through the Old Testament. The Old Covenant was a marriage arrangement between Jehovah and His people. Right? Well, what's the new marriage covenant? All right, the Old Covenant, it was a marriage between Jehovah and Israel. Not all Israel, the Israel of God. Okay? So we come over here and we start talking about the new covenant. And God said, I was going to make a new covenant. What did He say was the reason for doing away with the old covenant? Because His wife cheated on Him over and over and over again. This covenant was based on performance. If the wife does her part, the husband will do his part. But the husband is going to break that covenant? But is the husband going to be unrighteous? So in order to break that covenant, what's the only righteous way to break it? Till death do us part. Who is Jehovah from the Old Testament? Christ. That's Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So who died on the cross? Jehovah, the Word. Well, who's resurrected? Jehovah, the Word. And what does He do? He becomes the husband of a new covenant. And so what he's telling them that day is, how in the world could I ask these people to fast at their wedding feast? Okay, it clear to everybody? All right. Now, um, let's see. All right, the Pharisees again show up at the wedding and want to know where's the sackcloth and ashes. Is there any room in salvation for legalistic tradition? No. None. None. Folks, it's got to go. It has got to go. And so the Lord begins teaching them these things. Now, when, when you talk about fasting in the New Testament, again, it's different than in the Old Testament, okay? But there is much fasting. But Hosea 6.6, 6, the Lord quotes, in this same passage, y'all find Hosea 6.6, 6, but if you read the parallel passage here in Matthew, at this time, He quotes this. And I want to show y'all what He says. If anybody doesn't know where Hosea is at, Sienna will help you. You remembered all the books of the Bible, didn't you? Yeah, okay. I had to step up my game because of her. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, you got to pick it up. Me. <laughs> all right, Hosea 6.6. 6. Now, is there a better book to think about in a marriage than Hosea? Hosea is the book about God's old marriage, isn't it? But it's also the book that talks about the new marriage he's going to have. But notice what he says in Hosea 6. Y'all go back, find Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, and you find Ezekiel, Daniel, and right after uh, Daniel you'll find Hosea 6. The Lord says this statement, and again, Christ quotes this at the same time. Luke doesn't include it, but here's the quote. He says, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now, what's he saying there? He's saying that they missed the point of the law. The point of the law, he didn't want all the sacrifices. He wanted obedience. He wanted them to worship him, to glorify him. The point of the law wasn't that you fast more and more. The point of the law was that you glorify God. And that's what the whole thing was about. And would Israel ever do that? No, they wouldn't do it. Okay? <clears throat> now, Christ's teaching did not go against the law. Let me say that again. All right? The Pharisees just couldn't fit it in there. So Christ explains to them their problem that day in a parable. Literally three parables. Okay? Let's flip back over there to Luke 5 and let's look at them again. Now, can we all agree that Christ knows exactly what their problem is? Amen. He's going to put His finger right on it here, okay? And we got to be careful with these because there's a lot of things that's said about this that's simply not true, okay? Now, He says in verse 36, He spake a parable unto them, No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old, 
He said, If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. Now the first parable, he's, he's talking about clothing. And it, it, it's a little different in Matthew, and I'm not even sure if it's the same, but it means the same, right? What he's saying here is this. You've got an old garment, and the old garment tears. Who in the world would go cut off a new garment to fix the old garment? What do you do? You throw the old garment out and you put on the new. You see, he's trying to show them you can't mix and match. Christianity is not an extension of Judaism. Does that make sense? So what the Jews were going to have to do was throw away their Judaism. Now, I'm not saying throw away their Old Testament. That's where the mistake comes in. Dispensationalism today will say that what he's telling them is you can't mix the new with the old. That's not true. You can't mix Christianity with Judaism and their tradition. Traditions. Judaism's traditions was not according to the Old Testament. It was according to their traditions. Look, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Everything in the New builds off the Old. What he's telling them is not, get rid of your Old Testament. He's telling them, get rid of your understanding of the Old Testament. Okay? So this is what he means. Now, um, you notice something about all of these, by the way? Every, all three of these examples, new cloth, new wine, and new wineskins have a power in them. Y'all think about new cloth. You know, in Matthew it's spoken a little different way, and we'll talk about it. If you've got an old garment and you get a tear in it. And when I was little, we would rip the knees in our blue jeans, and we had these patches that M Mama would sew them patches on, right? Well, if a Jew ripped his garment, if he had some new fabric, not just ruining a new outfit, but let's say he had new fabric. If you took that new wool or cotton, that's what they had, and you put that in that old fabric and you sewed it up and made it all nice and neat, what is that new 100% cotton or 100% wool going to do? It's going to shrink a bunch. You know what it's going to do to the old garment? It's going to tear it. It's going to make it worse. You know, they had what's called fullers. You'll read about Christ calling himself a fuller. A fuller's job was to pre-shrink the, the stuff. That was what he did. So basically what he's saying is this. You cannot mix and match because if you try and mix and match what I'm teaching with what you believe, both of them will be destroyed. Does that make sense? So what the Pharisees needed to do that day was exactly what Paul needed to do. And what did Paul do? He took off the old garment and threw it out. All his Judaism, he threw it out the door and he said, it's dung. Remember that? And he puts on the new. Now that's the thing these Pharisees couldn't do. To let go of their tradition. And folks, it's what people today, it's the, it's the battle you see them fighting today. The gospel is preached and they fight tooth and nail to hang on to something that they think they possess. You know, it's an easy thing to get rid of what you possess if you believe you can possess it again, isn't it? In other words, how is it a hard thing to stop and say, well, you know what, maybe I better consider my salvation again. Maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I need to examine this all over. If you're saved, what's the worst that could happen? You'll conclude that, okay, I'm saved. What if you're not? The Pharisees wouldn't even consider it. Does that make sense? Now, it, when they wouldn't consider this, he goes on to another parable. He says again in verse uh, 37, he said, No man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottle shall perish. Now, they made out of goat and sheepskin. They would take the sheepskin, they would tan it, right? Make a good leather tan hide, and then they would stitch it up together. Literally, they would take, most of the time, the whole body of the lamb, and they would stitch up the leg holes and all that, and they would use the neck as an opening, and literally, they would make like a leather canteen. If you've ever seen some of them real old army canteens, they were leather. Now, leather has a certain amount of flexibility, doesn't it? You remember when we were, uh, oh man, remember them deck shoes, Gina? We all started started wearing deck shoes back then. Remember that? You know what they'd tell you to do with your deck shoes? Put them on barefooted, which is how we wore them, and get in the tub and stand in it, get them all soaking wet, and then wear them. Why? They'll mold to your feet. We do the same thing with a baseball glove, right? Oil it up and put it in, right? Leather will stretch a certain amount, right? But once it's stretched, that's it. Now, what does new wine do? What happens with wine? What's going on? Fermentation. Okay? It's fermenting and it's putting off a gas. 
He, I, I, I really appreciate one thing my old man did. It, he got into making wine when I was in high school, and he would make wine out of figs, tomatoes, I mean everything. He didn't even like it. He just liked the, he loved the idea of eating something weird. I mean, seriously, didn't he, Gina? And so he would make all these weird wines, but he had these Kentwood water bottles. Y'all know what I'm talking about? The big, and it would sit up there on his place where he did it, and he had a tube in the top, and the tube come out and made a loop, like a still sort of, and it had water in the tube to kind of keep but about every five minutes it would go <clears throat> he called it burping it was the the fermentation gives off a gas and it's expanding if he didn't have that vent it would blow his bottle up well what the Lord is saying is if you've got new wine it's yet to expand right if you put that in an old skin what's going to happen you're going to bust the skin and lose the wine you can't mix the old with the new now this not only fits doctrinally, folks, this fits with our life. Consider Matthew. Matthew could not continue as he was and just add Christianity to the mix, could he? It's a fresh start. And again, today you've got to be clear with folks. Nobody's saying you've got to quit your job. You've got... Folks, Jesus Christ is either the most important thing in the world to you or He's not. Now that's really where we've got to begin. You know, people would ask, I've been asked several times if I would trade places with Bill Gates. Are you kidding me? Come on. Go straight to hell? No. Uh-uh. I wouldn't even consider it. They said, well, would you I wouldn't trade places with anybody. What would I say if I said I would trade? I'd say, well, then I know better than God knows. Folks, salvation is the most important thing in the entire universe for each individual. And if it's not, we need to look at it. Because if it's not, do we really understand what we're to be saved from? Eternal torment. A place where Jesus said the flames never stop and the worms never die. Can y'all imagine that? I mean, I, I, the torment, I can't even imagine. He, I got, I've told y'all before, I got in a wreck in high school. And I hit the dash and cracked two teeth on this side and one on this side. I mean, it hurt bad. And we run off the end of a road right out at like through the air and hit a sand pile and boom, I hit it. Well, the next day I had just got, an, I was right out of high school. I just got, my sister got me a job at the shipyard over in Gulfport building them hovercrafts. I couldn't call in sick. Brand new job, can't do that. I went to work that day. I had a doctor's appointment, a dentist appointment after work. And that was the worst day in my my entire life. I was inside that aluminum boat in that aluminum compartment and I was electrician's helper so I was sitting in front of a panel putting markers on a, and all day long behind me was a guy with a chipping hammer and I sat there just in the worst pain I have ever been in and finally it went on and on and I finally decided you know what if I can make it to lunch I can leave and put in a half day and I'll make it they'll understand that right I'll even show them I had a bruise I can spit some blood it'll be okay so I said, okay, I can make it to lunch. I, I just got there, well, I put it on, I got with it. Finally, several hours had passed and I looked at my watch. Y'all know what? Ten, Ten minutes. Ten minutes had passed. Why? The pain. The pain. The pain. Folks, the clock wouldn't move. Can y'all imagine eternity in hell? I can't. What in the world would be worth possessing to face that? What did Matthew say? Anything but that. Anything, right? And he dumped it all aside. Now that's the attitude. If our attitude is, let me keep the old and figure out how I can squeeze this new in. Mm -hmm. It's wrong. Okay? It's got to be like the parable said. When the man found the pearl of great price, what did he do? Whatever it took to get the pearl. Okay? That's the whole uh, point he's making here in this uh, picture. Now there's one other thing he says here. In verse uh, 38 he says, New wine must put in new bottles, and both are preserved. No man, also having drunk old wine, straightway desireth the new, for he saith the old is better. Y'all know I'm not a wine connoisseur, but I know that's the truth. Yeah. Old wine is better, but not in the Bible. I don't know how they made wine in or whatnot, but if you read the Bible, what was the best wine? Yeah. New wine. I suspect that the new wine 
did something that, that the others didn't, but what they would do, they were always wanting the new wine. It says, new wine, rejoice the face. Remember it would say several times, they're drunk on new wine. I don't know if it, if it was more, I, I don't understand it, but in the Bible, the new wine is better. But let's not focus so much on that as let's just say it this way. We prefer the old to the new. Now what was the old in the context? The old way of life, the old traditions, the old theology, the old position, the old everything. In other words, we'll take status quo. Who wants to step out and risk everything, right? But look at what the publicans did, at least Matthew. Folks, Matthew, like Abraham, heard, follow me, and got up and had no idea where he was going. All he knew is, going there is better than going there. And he got on with it, didn't he? Isn't that something we can all say? Yeah. And so when we try and hang on to the old, you know, it's a, it's, again, it's a form, I'm using the word conservative, and I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes politically. Look, I am a political conservative, okay? I'm not saying I, I, I don't worship Donald Trump or anything. I'm just telling y'all that I believe in fiscal conservative. In other words, it, to me, work hard, and, and right? But when it comes to just conservatism, we will fight to hang on to something that ain't worth having. I mean, really, we will. We will fight tooth and nail to hang on to something that ain't doing nothing but hurting us. Y'all ever thought about it? Mm -hmm. I remember fighting tooth and nail to hang on to a business, and when the business finally went under, I look back now and I think, thank God I didn't hang on to that. Mm -hmm. I'd have went straight to hell. And so the, the idea here about the, the publican was this. When Jesus was eating with the publican, what was the main difference between every publican in that room and the Pharisee? There's one stark contrast between them. The publican knew what he was. The publican knew what he was. If you know what you are and it ain't good, you'll desire something else. But if you think you're something that you're not and it's good, you will not desire something else. That's the whole point. Folks, Christianity really comes down to this. A person becomes miserable about their sin. And this is what the Lord said. We become miserable in our sin. Now let's go over to Matthew 5 before we quit. The Lord just puts it in other terms. You know, one way we could say it in these parables would be this. We try to patch Jesus on. Can't do it. We try to bottle Jesus up. You ever notice we like to put limits on the Lord and what He can and can't do? Lots of people like to say He can't save someone that's not looking for salvation. You ain't never met a human being looking for salvation that the Lord's not already working with. And then the last thing is some just refuse to try Him at all. Now, but watch what He says about this. In Matthew 5, He says, uh, verse 2, He opened His mouth and taught them, saying... Now, what He's about to teach, we call the Beatitudes. You could just say it's what the attitudes be of those that enter the kingdom. This is the attitude of the Christian. And it is completely foreign to the Jew. Watch. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Would you say that the average Jew was poor in spirit? Yeah. Certainly not the Pharisee. What were they instead? Lifted up in pride. Y'all remember when they told Jesus, Save, we're Abraham's seed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Notice he didn't say there shall be. He's not telling me and you if we will get poor in spirit, he'll save us. He's saying when you meet someone poor in spirit, they're already mine. Right? Verse three, uh, yeah, 4. Blessed are they that mourn. Well, mourn over what? Over being poor in spirit. Mourn over our sin. Mourn over our unrighteousness. Mourn over what we are. He said, they shall be comforted. Now there is temporary comfort in this life, but who would change that for what that man in Luke 16 got? You remember Luke 16, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? Rich man said, no, I'll, I'll stay status quo. I've got it pretty good. Didn't know he was dying that night. And when he died, what was he in? Torment. He looked over and saw through the physical realm. He sees Lazarus, who spent all his physical life in torment. What was Lazarus doing? He was in Abraham's bosom. You see the difference? Now he says in verse 5, Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Meek doesn't mean uh, a wimp. But meek means bowed down before God. That's, Moses was not a coward. I mean, Moses was a brave man, but he's called the meekest man that ever lived. Yeah. 
Verse 6, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. Now what does it mean to hunger and thirst after righteousness? To want, more. to want more. To desire to please God. Look, it is to wake up each day and know I have so much imperfection. And Lord, if you would grant me one thing this day, it's not going to be money or riches or even happiness or even an easy day. If you'll grant me one thing this day, it's to walk closer with you. Like the person that wrote that song, Just a Closer Walk With Thee. Boy, I love to hear Randy Travis sing that one. Y'all ever heard him sing it? It's great, but just a closer walk with thee. That's what a Christian desires. That's what we seek after. He says in verse uh, 7, Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. When you have been shown mercy, what do you begin to show? Mercy. mercy. He says, Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Now how are we going to be pure in heart when the Bible tells me that I'm born with a heart that is incurable? If my heart is incurable, guess what? I better give up on it. Imagine the doctor telling you you have an incurable heart and you spend the next two years trying to get it fixed. New valves, new, new this, new that. Nothing's working. I mean, every day your heart is failing. You're, you're hanging on by a breath. You don't know when the last breath's going to be. And you, you just keep working and working. You know, you're going to stop and think, wait a minute. If I'd have just put my name on the transplant list two years ago, I'd have that new heart by now. What does a person need that has an incurable heart? They need a new heart. And what did Christ give to Matthew? That's why he followed Jesus because he had a new heart. That's why he responded to the call. He was regenerated. That's why he gave up everything that was keeping him from following Christ because that new heart belonged to God and he is now joined unto the Lord and he wasn't going to be separated from him. There's the attitude we need to have. Uh, boy, I pray to God He would reinforce this to us and give all of us a closer walk with Him. You say, well, how do we get it? Well, we start off by desiring it. And if we desire it, don't mean you know how to get the things we desire? Y'all know when we really desire something, what do we do? We set our sights on it and try and get it, don't we? Well, how do you go about desiring and getting this? You set your sights on it and go to God. And it becomes the most important thing. We pray about it. Hey, you can fast and pray about it. Show Him you're serious. Whatever it is, whatever it takes. Do everything we can to walk closer to God. And the two tools He's given us above all others are His Word and prayer. And that's how we get closer to Him. Okay? All right, any questions? Uh-huh. Bob said he'd like to be here, but he'd been out of town a lot. He'd been gone a couple months. Yeah. When he come back, said, I'm coming to church Wednesday night. If you'll see me. I said, okay. He didn't call me back. Said he got sick. Yeah. And he's not here today. I don't know what he's got. I hadn't talked okay. to him. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. I'd got texts from him, but y'all pray for Bobby. Um, Wayne said he's gotten sick. We sure miss him, don't we? Yes. Ain't nothing better to see Bobby's smiling face coming here. He's always in a good mood, isn't he? He's great. Yeah, we love Bobby and we miss him. Y'all pray for Bobby. And uh, y'all pray for Chris and Dina who are out of town. Y'all pray for Maddie who uh, I think may have COVID possibly. Um, yeah, probably. Um, Y'all pray for uh, Lonnie and his wife. And Lonnie, pray for Tanner and all Lonnie's kids. Y'all pray for all of us. We all need prayer all the time. Okay? All right, let's go to Lord in prayer. Our Father, thank You for the gift of Your Word. Lord, we thank You for regeneration, which allows us to see the truths of Your spiritual realm. Father, we thank You for giving us a kingdom where we might inherit things in our Savior. We thank You for giving us a future and a hope that's beyond this earth. Help us, Lord, to look at the things that are temporary as not those things to be desired, but the things that are eternal. Help us keep our hearts from setting them on this world, Lord, and to set them upon You. When we fail to do that, Lord, forgive us, draw us back to You in prayer, and keep us dedicated to feeding on your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.